Hello, everybody, and welcome to another We Love Cycling video podcast. And my guest on this episode is the young American rider, Matteo Jorgensen, who rides for Team Movistar. Now, Matteo is a wonderful young man, 23 years of age, um, has had an absolute spectacular season so far for his Spanish World Tour team. He's mixed it up in the classics, was top 10 in the Tour of Flanders, top 10 in Paris-Nice, Recently, he finished second overall in the Tour of Romandy, and he talks about his objectives for the future, the way he trains, the way he's, he recovers, and also the importance, the fundamental importance of consistency. It's a real deep dive into training, nutrition, and everything that's important about racing in the contemporary scene now. Hope you enjoy it. Matteo, thanks very much for joining us, mate. Um, really do appreciate it. You've had quite a magnificent first part to the season, haven't you? I mean, you packed in a lot. It, it almost feels like we completed a whole season, such as the level of your success, really. Yeah, it's felt like that too for me. <laughs> uh, no, it's been amazing. Thank you, Matt. Um, it's, been, it's been unreal this spring. And coming into the winter, um, in terms of objectives, did you, obviously you, you did have a set of objectives, and I, I know you did, but how much of that have you actually hit in terms of what you wanted to do, where you wanted to be? Yeah, I the the biggest goal I had was win win my first bike race. Um, that's really what I wanted to do, and I achieved that right off the bat in Oman. So <laughs> from there, everything else was kind of um, yeah, just just cherry on the top, or like just trying to trying to achieve more. Um, but yeah, I did I did have the goal of, of being top three in in one of these uh, world tour stage races. Um, yeah, that, that's just me in my head. I didn't even tell my coach that. The only goal I told my coach was <laughs> was that I wanted to win a bike race because that's a pretty achievable and you know clear goal. Um, and yeah, that that I got I got done quick. So then I had to kind of move on and and um, go after Perry Nice and Romandy. So yeah, the 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 for me winning was was uh, the most important, and I'm super happy. Because if you professional cycling, it's a a brutally tough sport but winning bike races is, is really hard and, and when you think about the the time that you're a professional cyclist and winning seems even harder for a lot of riders because there's a, there's an elite cluster of riders who seem to be picking up a lot more wind disproportionately so in previous years yeah. and it's always been such a fundamentally important point in a pro's career to get that win so just tell us explain how that changed the way you you you've been thinking and approaching things just that one that one win yeah, I mean, that's funny you ask that. It's something that I haven't really even thought about, but I know has made an effect on me. Um, and yeah, I think it is. I think it's it is maybe the biggest thing that I could have done is is get that win because I I think it kind of just changes something mentally. I think as a kid, you watch guys who win and and you you see that like you see it as out of reach at least i did and it, it feels like something yeah it, you don't know really the path to get there or how they did it or um yeah it's just such a big thing as a kid and and watching so i think trying to get there and then achieving like like i think the 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 jump from like being top three or top five or top ten to actually a win is a lot bigger than than you realize and then like kind of when you're in it and you're like those, my first three years pro, I was kind of trying to get there and, and yeah, it was just, it just always felt out of reach. I would get close, but it's like close and cycling doesn't, doesn't really get you much. It just doesn't, doesn't move the needle. So actually, yeah, getting from, you know, those top fives or promising results to a win was like, um, yeah, w it did change a lot mentally. And I think has helped me tremendously afterwards, just this spring and, the amount of confidence I've had that I'm on the right track and that, you know, I can keep doing the work and yeah, it, it just kind of changes everything. It is, it is an interesting one, isn't it? When you're in a leader's Jersey or you, you've, you've, you're not far off winning or just subsequent to winning your first bike race. It's just, there's the mentality off the bike, but then when you're in the Peloton, there's a different confidence. Yeah. You do feel it's very different, difficult to describe unless you've experienced it, I guess, but you do feel 
the confidence that it's it's kind of tangible when you when you're on that crest of a wave and you're feeling good just the way you carry yourself in a bunch you you just sure. know there's a there's a fundamental difference isn't there yeah yeah it really steeps into a lot of a lot of things that's one of them for sure uh where you can be in the bunch and it, it i mean it could be how you hold yourself it also could be how other riders perceive you and where they let you ride and um that probably changes you know I, I probably something that i that i haven't even picked up on but maybe it's just that i'm able to ride in the front you know going to perry nice after Oman. i've done perry nice a lot of times and i don't think i've ever seen the front of of <laughs> perry nice as much as this year um and yeah i think that changes and yeah i i mean there's just probably tons of tiny little things psychologically that that um that kind of wind changes so yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it was a huge, huge difference afterwards. Before we drill down a little bit into, I want to drill down into that amazing Twitter thread you put out yes yesterday, because um, we we we'd made the call to do this chat, and then I was just looking up some stuff, doing a little bit of research, and a real timely thread. I, I want to go into that if you don't mind, because I think it's really open, yeah. really refreshing, sure. and actually. You know, I was commentating on Romandy the other week um, when you when you play second, and I was struck um, by your openness and and your candidness, and also your intelligence in interviews. It's really quite refreshing. You know, a lot of guys play card their cards close to the chest, and there was a real lovely um, freshness about what you were saying. But before we do that, it's talking about Parry Nice, and this is something I do ask pretty much everybody right now because I think it's relevant. W- what is it? You've been a pro now. This is about. Th- Three years at World Tour? Three years at World Tour now? Yeah, yeah. this is my fourth. Yeah. yeah, so what has it been like, this shift in racing that we've seen since lockdown, basically? The, the racing has become far more frenetic, unpredictable. From your perspective, what has it been like seeing that particular shift? And bearing in mind, you're still only, tw- only 23 years of age, so you're part of this guard, but have you know, what's it been like for you coping with those those kind of big shifts in racing tactics, et cetera? Yeah, well... <laughs> it's it this this concept is something that like is it's funny because when you go to a race it's all we talk about in the team because at least in my team we have yeah we have such a a spread of of ages usually when you go to a race and and you know you go to a race with guys that are 35 36 that have been doing it for you know been a pro for 15 years or and then you also have neo pros and i think also, I, I have to say contextually that, I mean, I entered in my first year pro was 2020. So I started and did two races uh, or three races and then lockdown hit. So really all I know is the new, this like new form of cycling. So I can't really give it that much context um, uh, about what it was like before, other than what I could watch and what I hear from my teammates, because yeah, I mean, for them, it's like... <laughs> it's yeah these these guys that have been doing it for a while it's 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 a crazy change and they really can't a lot of some of them can't wrap their head around like why it's changed so much and and what to do now and i mean yeah in in some ways a lot of them are considering like you know retirement just because of this it's it's changed that much um but yeah i think the things that that i can see that have that have quote unquote changed were basically a uh, uh like a they're very similar to what when i came up through junior and u23 so i didn't perceive that much change because in junior u23 these things were already quite you know this this yeah data driven thing the way we race all that you know positioning and the fight and all that stuff you know kind of yeah was seamless as i entered pro it didn't change too much so i can't really talk about how how it was before it's interesting that um it's been talked about that much in teams i had a conversation a few few weeks ago with roan dennis obviously one of the older guard who is retiring now um obviously on a rival Mm -hmm. team but he was saying that he's he's finding it quite hard to wrap his head around it and bear in mind he's he's a top draw rider you know more than capable but he said you you ride a 2.1 and he said you you know every day you're doing 330 watts normalized just on a steady day he said (laughs) He said, so basically it's really hard to to go to a race to actually back off a little bit. He said, so the 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 frequency and the intensity of the racing is impacting on everything else that you've ordinarily done as a pro before. So trying to wrap your 100%. head around it. 
yeah, trying to wrap your head around it if that's not what you've done. I mean, it's, I don't think it's the sole contributing factor to him retiring, but he said that it's that hard now that I'm really now in the second phase of my life thinking about the other things that matter, like family and stuff. And right. and maybe you, you you might get some older riders like stopping short slightly because this this shift is something that they cannot kind of wrap their head around. Right, right. No, 100%. And, you know, there's there's changes in, in I mean, it has effects on everything. Like I was talking just at Roman D with, with Pachi Vila, my coach, and he was saying how how much this change has affected training in the way that we recover especially from our aces he basically has to like think about the recovery time from every race we do as double now wow. like if you yeah if you do <laughs> it's amazing you know if you do a if you do a monument now it's like you need a you need a week to recover and before it was three four days um and i think yeah that ties into all of this stuff why we see guys race less uh why we don't see guys you know use races as preparation anymore because it's like if you go to a race and you're not prepared already, you're going to have a really bad time and it's not going to be very helpful for you. So it's really, I think, yeah, it's a shift in, in almost every regard. Yeah. It, it, I'm going to move rooms really quick, Matt. Sorry. Yeah, no no worries, man. No worries at all. <clears throat> My siblings just got home. Uh, They're making uh, some breakfast. So uh, no worries at all. No worries. <sighs> Adds a little bit of uh, added context to the to the video. <laughs> so where yeah, just, leave, just, like, just like, go ahead and leave all this in. Yeah, it's like Mateo Jorgensen cribs. So where are we now? <laughs> We're in my little gym, guest bedroom, and storage room now. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice change of location. So well, that br- that 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 brings us on quite nicely, actually, to not just the, the style of racing that we're seeing, but also the versatility. And when you look at Okay, we're only in, we're only just started May, and if you look at the races that you've chosen to ride and perform well in, there's a real diverse, you know, there's a, a super diverse nature to that. Classics, the way you performed in the classics, week long stage races. Hopefully, that will map across into your next objectives, the Tour de France, Dauphiné, and the Tour de France. But at what point, Matteo, did you harbour this desire to really mix things up and not be pigeonholed as? as a sort of rider that just does week-long stage races, grand tours or classics. We're seeing it more more and more now, but was that a conscious decision or was it something that always felt quite natural? You just wanted to do everything. No, no. I think it came a lot of, it, it's come from just the, just the last three years and, and the amount of times I get the question, like what type of rider are you and what, yeah. uh, yeah and i mean i normally get it from you know at the mix zone at races or from the press but also from my own team and uh yeah my coach wants to know what i want to do more because for him it would make it a hell of a lot easier to train me if he <laughs> yeah. if he knew what type of rider i was and yeah so I, I kind of i think i wanted to prove to myself mainly that i could do both i mean we're not talking about everything we're just talking about classics and and uh gc at least that week-long gc and so yeah i kind of i think in my head i knew they were somewhat compatible because they both they both take yeah they both just take efficiency i think that's most of it it's like we're not talking about doing like being a sprinter that that's on the completely other end or or even being a puncher guy who yeah that, that sort of stuff is pretty incompatible with what i'm talking about here and so i think I knew it was I knew it was reachable because in the last three years I've done well or I've done yeah well for my own standards at, at both races and I've been able to kind of train for both so I just kind of yeah we made the plan Patchy and I to to try to do both and um, he you know the confidence that he had that I could do it made me realize that yeah I could probably do it just because he has a lot of experience and so yeah we kind of just made that plan. I mean. Looking back to, I mean, it's a d- different era. The, going back to while we all started riding, I mean, you, you you don't pigeonhole yourself then, do you? And, and there's a real joy. To to work as hard as you do, you need to find some sort of joy in what you do, don't you? Cycling is it's a, it's a beautiful sport, ridiculously hard, getting even harder. But do you think the ver- doing different things just keeps things fresh mentally as well? Because it's a, it's a physiological, physiologically, the demands are very similar. Um, but from a from a skill set perspective, 
riding getting running top ten in Flanders and, and running podium in in Romandy is so <laughs> completely and utterly different. But yeah, it sounds like what a lot of fun, you know, being able yeah. to p- participate at the top level in both of those sorts of things. But it's good for the mind, I think. Yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent, and I think that was a lot of it. I think the I think the the main thing a coach wants to kind of uh, at least a good coach can can get out of you or or wants to get out of you is what you want to do and what yeah. like inspires you and because the amount of yeah, like you said, the amount of work that you have to put in, like it really takes, yeah, you having joy in doing all of it because if not, you just won't be able to do it. Um, so I think, yeah. I I really liked the challenge and and also the I really like these these races in Belgium and and races in you know where you're really challenged like for five six hours at every moment and the positioning and and all that stuff I really like and I kind of told him that and and he understood that so um, yeah and that's also the reason that I'm not that inspired to do like GC at a three week race because to me the amount of kind of uh, sp- yeah specificity you need to do and and uh not only in training but just in your life and and then in the race you have to be kind of a really boring rider because you just kind of have to be super efficient and and be yeah you have to hold yourself back all the time and it's just something that doesn't inspire me right now so yeah i think these just this challenge that i i made was was um it made all kind of all the work that I was doing more fun and and more worth it. So, are you saying then, like you had next up Dauphiné Tour? What are you going to? What's going to be your objectives in the tour then? Um, what, what definitely what, stages? Stages to just win bike races, just go in there, target some stages. Have you? Are there, yeah. like given the game away, is there any yet that you've looked at that you've done recons on that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, I just did a recon. The only thing I've reconned is one after Roman D, we were so close to the the one TT that's in the tour. So we went and looked at it. And it's a very similar TT to Roman D where I did pretty well. And, and I really liked this TT. It's, it's a hilltop finish. It's yeah, it's, it's like Roman D, except we finish at the top instead of the bottom. Um, and yeah, that, that's a cool TT. But yeah, also in the tour we have, we're going with Enrique, who's like, yeah. I see has made huge leaps and bounds from last year's tour and I'm excited to help him also because I think he has a realistic shot of being on the podium. And yeah, that, that also inspires me to see him do that um, after, especially bouncing back after last year and, and all his kind of, yeah, descending issues last year. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a commentator and as a fan of the sport, just watching how the different teams perform year on year, and there's a couple of teams this year that have fundamentally shifted. I think um, one of them's EF, and and the others Mobistar. You guys are racing with a, with real liberty, and that's not to say you weren't before. But um, what do you think the changes in the team? I mean, clearly as individuals, you're able to express yourself, um, mm-hmm. but this seems to be far more aggressive riding. That as soon as you get those couple of wins, this confidence carries on. It's the snowball effect. But is there anything else that you can pinpoint in the team? Um, in relation to the relative success that you've you've had this year across the board, yeah, it, for me it comes down to one thing, and it's the points battle last year. Uh, right, okay, right. For how for how negative and and uh, genuinely like uh, stressful it was in the in the moment in last year, like how I mean you could see it with the whole every single member of the team from the from the swan years to the mechanics to the, because I mean, in the end they were all at a risk of losing their job. Uh, and so this, this stress that we all had, um, it changed the team entirely and the mentality, I mean, it mainly changed the mentality of how we were approaching races, how we built the calendar. Um, because before I think it's safe to say Movistar would, would base their calendar like pretty solely around GC and yep. pretty solely around the Grand Tours, like GC yep. at the Grand Tours. And the rest of the races were just kind of in support of that. Um, or, you know, yeah, just just to try to try to get the riders in shape to get to to get to those objectives. And now I think they fell behind because yeah, because of all the things we talked about earlier, how cycling has changed and how we can't use these races as preparation anymore. You have to show up ready to race and and they're just raced completely differently. So now I think 
they, yeah, I think last year's points battle forced, forced the team to evolve in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, for how, for how really like hard it was last year for everyone, uh, I think we all came out of it a lot stronger. So yeah, I think in, in the end it was positive despite my personal opinions on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's like you say, you, you do, it feels like a different team and obviously no, I know Max very well. Max Keandre was an ex-teammate of mine when I was a pro and that guy I know very well. So, and he's obviously yeah. been with Movistar for a while now. So uh, just to see that, that success, um, no, it's, it's good. It, it's, I think it's just good for the sport as well. It, it, it really, really is now. Now. Okay. Mateo, this tweet that we essentially deconstructed um, or tried to deconstruct your success this year, as best you can do that. It's generally, of course, it's going to be hard work. Very, easy for a lot of people to forget that behind the scenes uh, professional athletes across the board if they're successful at elite level work really hard they, you know but in particular there's some key points that you were looking at one of which was this consistency with a, you know somebody who's an inspiration to you Nate Wilson can you just explain a little bit about that because that is essentially it's almost an ideology isn't it rather than whatever you do it's just make sure you do it consistently so that is something that at the core of what you do quite clearly so can you just explain that to me a little bit yeah for sure um nate who is now a, a trainer at ef he he was the um he was the kind of head of of usa cycling the under 23 program at the time that i came through and yeah i mean he kind of uh, he became my coach those years. And, and, um, I guess he, he kind of, he always talked in these, the biggest thing for me that I learned from him was that he was talking in a way bigger time, uh, a way bigger time, uh, point or yeah, amount of time that I was used to. So right. we like, you know, he, he would, he would talk to me about like the winter period as a, as a one block of training, you know, he's like, you need to get this many hours in between the months of uh, December 1st and, you know, the end of February. So like a and, macro rather than a micro look. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it kind of changed my whole perception of things. Like if, if you take that, if you, if you zoom out to that level of like multiple months as you're kind of like, you, you, you think of the, these blocks as multiple months or years. And he would talk about like, you know, you make these jumps every year and, and, uh, because of like the load of the season and then you have that multiple month off season. And then, it, it, I mean, when you zoom out like that, it, it really helps. I mean, at least for me, it really helped like every day you, you don't have to, you know, stress about all the details. You just have to get the things right. You know, you just have to like move on. And, and even if things aren't going perfectly or, or they're going really well, it's all kind of adding up as long as you keep going uh and yeah i mean for me he that kind of just changed a lot of things uh just the way i guess yeah he he kind of drilled that into my head so that was really helpful i, I guess th that sort of uh idea um it's almost like a a tenet isn't it of of the way you exist you, you can you can apply that to a lot of different things in life um because you know from day each day is different there's there's highs and lows but ultimately if you if you keep building those foundations and you step away and look at it things will change over time it, it is a it's it's something that's very easy to forget especially yeah. especially when you're a little bit younger and, and when you are younger your time frames are, are narrower firstly you've not been on the earth quite as long as as bright and as as intelligent that you are but uh, conceptually um Definitely. yeah look, look, looking looking zooming out is quite a hard thing to do it's like when yeah. you you know Christmas Eve with you, with your parents. Oh, well, when can we open the presents? It's like you want it now, don't you? Everything is kind of now. You, but you and that that yeah. it does take a little bit of time when you're young to to kind of fall away from. But it's um it's a really I think it's an interesting thing to to remind anybody. I think anybody who who is looking at, at succeeding in anything needs to. Yeah. Okay, if you do you believe in what you're doing, okay, yeah. then just stick with it. Bang, just go, just bang it, and and it's it's really valuable. No, it really, really has to do with, uh, yeah, I think I, I took it a little farther than, than where he even kind of, uh, yeah, was trying to teach me about it. But I think it really goes into every aspect of, yeah, of everything. Um, yeah, if you, if you think about cycling, it's like all these things happen in really long, long time frames. Like, yeah. I remember when, when I was U23, it would be like, how do I lose weight? And it'd be like, okay, 
you know, I would just be like, okay, I would just get back from a six hour ride. and I'm just not going to eat until the next morning, you know, like it. And then you think about, and he, he would kind of teach me like, no, it's not about that. It's about like, like that, like it doesn't change in a day. It's going to take like three, four months to do that. Or, Or one interval session, you know, you like get back and maybe didn't, maybe you did only like, you could only do three or three out of the four intervals. This, this would happen with Nate and he'd be like, well, it doesn't matter. Cause you got 75% of the work. You still got 75% of it done. Like, yeah. and then you got the rest of the volume done. You got the hours done, like just move on. And, and yeah, it, these kind of things, it, it, it's yeah. It made a huge difference. And and what about this, this, this other, like consistency is one thing. And then one thing that, that really struck me was, Obviously, clearly recovery, enormously important and even more important now, as you just uh, pointed out a few moments ago, because of the the increased workload, the increased, stri- the increased stresses of racing. But you were saying that you got yourself into some pretty deep holes, um, mm-hmm. al- almost semi on purpose. Um, and then learn. And then, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're running a grand tour and you want to finish. There's only right. so much you can do apart from pull the plug, isn't there? You've just got to just try and finish the race. So <laughs> sometimes <laughs> yeah, your yeah, hand yeah. is forced, but. Can you explain that conceptually as well about the, these these sure. real deep holes, fatigue holes that you got yourself into, and then yeah. subsequently have learned from and got better from? Yeah, I wish I could say it was on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, it wasn't on purpose at all. But um, no, like you said, I mean, these things kind of just creep up on you. Like you have you set these objectives and i remember i mean i can say use 2021 as an example and i i would set i set the objective of perry nice that year um the team kind of didn't have a gc guy for perry nice and they were like yeah mateo we'll give you the shot in the winter so i trained like a madman all winter for perry nice my home race i was really inspired and i i was eight there and that for me was like huge you know it was a big step and so after that i, I just had this like mindset of, of from then on, I was just like, okay, I just need to maintain this. I just need to like keep, we, we use this term, me and Larry Warbass, another American here, we we make fun of ourselves because we, we find ourselves using this like phrase all the time. We're like, we got to keep the engine running. Or you get back from a race and you're just like, you got to keep the engine running. And you do these efforts and you maybe are tired and you wake up feeling like shit, but you just like keep, yeah, I mean, it's, self, it's self-destructive. You keep doing it. Um, and so that whole spring, I would just kind of keep the engine running. And I went from Perry Nice to Kobe Bartley. And slowly, I just got, you know, I would just get worse and worse and worse. Um, but I just kept doing it because I thought, you know, you just kind of think that you'll come out of it. And yeah, I went to altitude, this big altitude camp with the team. And we just went farther into it. And then once I started the year, I realized, like, literally the the jeer star with a prologue and i remember in this prologue my heart rate didn't even get up to like i mean i did it full gas completely full gas and it was like five six k i think and my heart rate didn't even get the threshold you know and it's like God, these are that, these are that's, this that's is a big warning one. light that is a warning oh, light yeah. about fatigue isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and this was day one of a three-week race you know um God. but yeah in the end these yeah i, I went through that race and i got i mean it's also like I got it done. Um, and that's, you know, that's just my body. I mean, that's just, I guess, a, a, some, some form of talent that I was able to actually finish because I think maybe some other, I mean, I think it's not always a hundred percent that you can be in that much fatigue and still finish a grand tour. So I have to thank like my genetics for that. Um, I was able to get through it and then, and then from then on also recover from it. Um, even, yeah, that year it took me, I think it just took me a long time. You know, you, you, you take a few weeks off after, and I think I came back that summer and stuff and was there, but I still wasn't, my body wasn't, I knew I wasn't recovered from it. And, but you still have a job and you still have to do, you still have to go to the races and finish yeah. your season. Um, and it wasn't, it, yeah, it, it's not until real off season where you take like that month completely off, which Nate was really big on and, and I really believe in is taking those like three, four weeks completely off the bike and with no stimulus. That's when you actually, when you let your body come out of it, you know, you yeah. kind of, you gain some weight and you allow kind of all your hormones to come back and you take that stress off the body and allow the adaptations to kind of happen. And that same, same story after last year's tour is like, I didn't recover until I took until I got through the, all those Italian races at the end of the year in Lankawi. And then I took a month completely off. And even then 
I started back training super easy to still allow, you know, uh, some rest and recovery because it took <laughs> literally months. It's, it's crazy the time frame of recovery. And uh, that's one thing that, you know, isn't, when you look at the, the best riders in the world winning the grand tours, I mean, that there are certain things in terms of recovery that are predetermined physiologically in terms of your genetics. Some riders will recover faster than others, but w- within that, yeah. you've, you've, what you just described, there's so many big takeaways, so many lessons to learn, isn't there, about the under- the importance of recovery. And, and again, just from my own experience, I've been in, in several holes because I thought, and it was back to what I, I didn't think about it. Like, I didn't describe it as keeping the engine running, but I thought the only way to recover was actually to keep just the, it was just mentally and physically just felt normal to keep riding because as a pro rider, right. you ride every day pretty much and not riding. There's a sense, a, a weird sense of guilt that I used to get. And it took me several yeah. years to understand that it's okay to just if if you if you're doing all this work it's okay if you don't feel great if you're honest one day just take it off that isn't going to shit all that's going to do is allow you to recover a little bit but that's that was one of the hardest things that to learn as, as a young rider i think is this you can it's okay to take a day off um yeah or, or longer it's, not periods. Only, it's not only okay it's where it's where these changes happen you know yeah. that's that's the part that i never really realized as a kid was that when you're out riding your bike, all you're doing is stressing your body. Like you're yeah. damaging certain aspects of your body. That's all that. It's pretty dark, that's isn't all, it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really is. But that's literally all you're doing. So the only the only time where you're making any sort of gain from it is after when you're letting your body recover. And that, of course, happens on a micro and macro scale. You know, every you might be in a training block and you're recovering every day. You know, when you go to sleep and you have, get a full night of sleep, you're recovering pretty well before the next day. But you also need these big periods when you when you yeah take it too far. Yeah, and and that goes back, especially you know your coach uh, Paxi Villa, uh, the coach at Mobistar. You clearly have a really good relationship w- with him, and and just describe how important that relationship is, that trust, the fact that you know you might feel certain things about your body, but then the fact that you are trusting somebody else to who arguably to a degree has even more of an understanding about you externally that's quite that's quite a thing isn't it but often because the science is there isn't it but how how is how is that relationship and how important is is trust between the coach between you and your coach yeah it's huge it's huge Uh, for me it's a really complicated thing and it's been (laughs) a really hard thing through my whole my whole cycling career um because yeah, like you said, you're 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 putting your trust in someone that they have a better understanding of where you're at than you do, and yeah, yeah and it's, it's a weird and concept, it's a isn't it? That, yeah, <laughs> it plays with your mind. It, it does. Um, but with Patchy, I think the tr- the the confidence that I've had in him was that he's had he he has so much experience, uh, not only being a rider, but then coaching he was in Bora and he was Sagan's coach for yeah all of Sagan's really great years and he I really believed going into it because we just started this year me and Patchy okay. uh, he just started coaching me starting this year starting I guess last off season after last off season um and yeah I think it's it's huge having the confidence that you know that a coach is is uh able to kind of like ride that like know where your limits are and know how much you need and like how much recovery or how much strain and stimulus you need because then you don't have to like you can just take that mental charge off of yourself um because in the past i've had coaches that i didn't fully believe in and when that's the case you go through your weeks and your and your training blocks with so much more mental load because you're yeah. kind of sitting there every day thinking okay was that ride a little too much like how do i feel you're laying in bed and you're like how tired am i right now yeah or how or, or was that not enough you're you're sitting there thinking all the, i mean at every moment about everything uh with that and so just being able to trust trust that your coach knows what he's doing and then also patchy has i think that what patchy has is this balance between a really big scientific knowledge and he 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 is really up on you know all the current science and he reads about this stuff all the time and he's able to balance it with his own racing experience and his own yeah. like you know he, he was a rider and and so there's a lot of coaches that have one have either this experience and they were a rider and 
or they or they were they're scientists basically and they went to school and they don't really know anything about what it's actually like to go out there and do these training rides or to do these races so yeah with patchy it's it's a really it's been for me a perfect balance of both and yeah it's it's been amazing like we the communication between us like basically i can say from january 1st basically every morning and every night i leave him a voice message and he leaves me a voice message back uh so i tell him every morning when i wake up what how i'm feeling give him some data points about like either how i slept some my hrv my weight that sort of thing but also my my sensation my feeling and my perception and then at night the same thing we i tell him how, how the training ride went how i felt after how yeah i mean i just kind of try to give him all the information possible because if you trust your coach you want to ba basically give them all the tools possible so that they can kind of manage this for you so yeah, yeah it's been uh it's been really good and i mean it looks like it from the results mate i mean the last thing i just want to touch on which i think um is an extension of what you've been talking about is your self-belief and it's something that you know co coaches can help of course analyze what you're doing give you that kind of very specific guidance in relation to what your goals are but it, it seems that you are you know exceptionally driven and 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 the one of the the points back to your thread again was about the fact that you you're spending quite quite a substantial amount of your salary on things to even to improve even further like going away on a training camp spending the whole of january away at altitude at, at your own kind of cost now a lot of people might think i mean that was quite interesting um, but I do know a little bit about the way the Movistar run this. It's quite a different team, I think, than a lot of teams traditionally. They don't have a lot of training camps, do they? I mean, Alex Dowsett was with Movistar for a few years, a rider I know very well. I was saying he had a great time there. It was slight, it was a slightly, it did things slightly differently to a lot of teams. And you were given freedom to, to do what you wanted to do outside. So so how's that been for you? Because clearly you are you just want to be the, the best bike ready you can, but it looks like yeah. you've done a lot of stuff off your own back, you know, from your own admission. Yeah. No, I want to be clear before I say, before I say anything that like all, all the things that I'm doing are, are above and beyond uh, what the team does. And that's not to say that the team doesn't provide everything you need to be a great bike racer. Uh, and I really think that, yeah, a lot of people have read this thread and think that, that the team is inadequately supporting his riders, which is not the case at all. Yeah. Uh, it's just the case that I, that I wanted to do more and that I had the, yeah, that, that I'm, yeah, I was just trying to make the point that I, um, yeah, the way I view like my salary in these years is like, I'm being paid this in order to perform well. It's not like I'm being, not being paid this so I can go buy some really nice car or something. It's so that I can, yeah. you know, like put this money back into myself and that's the way I viewed it. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I, I think I've invested all that or yeah, done all that, all, all that stuff because that's what I believe in. And, and it's been like, I'm happy to do it. You know, it's like, I, I, that's the way that I wanted to spend all my, that's the way I wanted to spend my money this year is, is to go all in. And, and I think it's also the nature of being an American in Europe and stuff. You're already all in when you come over here. Of course, um, yeah. And yeah, we talk about it with, I mean, I ride with Americans here and it's like, we already, we're already over here away from all of our friends, family, everything. So it's like, for us, the difference between me being in my apartment here in Nice or being alone on an altitude camp is very little. Like <laughs> it's, there's, there's just a change of where you are. It's not like I'm leaving, I'm, I've already left everything behind. So it, it's a really easy, easy investment for me to make. Including get, getting your own nutritionist as well, because again, again, how much difference has that made? From um, obviously, there's a lot more um, focus on nutrition now, which I think is one of the factors why we're seeing people going first, farther, first, etc. You know, like recovering nutrition. But how much dif difference has that made to what you do? A lot, a lot. Um, the team has a nutritionist too. Uh, it's just a different. Uh, philosophy of, of working that my nutritionist that I'm using now yeah is is very precise about things um and I like that personally I, I don't think it's right for every rider or, or everything but I really like having like we were talking about before this confidence that I mean fueling is one of these things where if you don't get it right if you don't eat enough you're 
like never going to be fueling this adaptation or this recovery from the damage you're doing. Um, and if you, and if you do it too much, you know, you, you gain weight and you're hurting performance because yeah, you're too heavy in a race. So it's really, it's a really fine balance. And the only way that I've found to get over that is to be really precise about things. And, uh, it really helps me mentally to have like to do that work. And it is work because you have to yeah sit there and before every meal kind of, yeah, look at the plan and then weigh out the things and, and make the meal. It's really hard to eat out and eat at restaurants because you don't know what they're putting in and stuff. So it's a, it's a sacrifice that I really like making because it gives me that like comfort, you know, it was yeah. really comfortable knowing that every day when I'm starting my Garmin and leaving for my ride that I'm fueled up and ready to do the efforts. And then also I'm not like it, you, you can see it really easily when you start tracking everything. If you're, if you're in a, you know, a slight deficit every day and you can have the confidence that you're going to lose weight if you need to lose weight or maintain or, or gain weight. So it's, for me, that precision is really, is really big and having, basically you're just taking that load off of you. And instead of you sitting down before every meal and thinking, okay, well, we have this ride coming up and this, you know, how much do I need to eat right now or whatever, which is what I used to do before. And you basically always screw it up. Now it's like somebody <laughs> else sits there and they look at your week ahead of you and they do it for you. You know, like they, they can sit there and see, okay, this is the, the training that he has planned and this is his days. And they can just kind of, cause they're also, they're also more qualified to do it than me. They've yeah. studied nutrition and they went to school for it and, so yeah, they, they, they kind of can tell you, uh, what to eat. And for me, it's, it's been game changing. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. One, one last question, um, before I let you go and thanks again for your time. It's been such a, an interesting conversation, mate. It really has, but you've got a few days off now before things kick in again. What does time off for Matteo Jorgensen look like? What, what do you like to do? Okay. You're not in America. You, you're kind of living alone or you've got roommates and stuff, but what how do you relax what 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 other stuff do you like to do when you're not all in um training mm. yeah uh, i'm i grew up uh doing a lot of outdoor stuff um i was yeah lucky enough to when i was a kid i was taking on tons of backpacking trips and just spent a lot of time in the outdoors so um that's kind of where i i have my most mental reset is when i'm outside and um yeah either like backpacking or camping or whatever and so yeah I, I kind of try to plan my siblings my sister especially my brother lives in Europe and my sister came over just now I'm from the U.S. and she met me here and we're just gonna go into the mountains for a little bit and and nice. um yeah just camp out there and yeah having my family here just with me and niece for a few days is really nice and that's kind of how I'm mentally resetting and just trying to yeah not think about uh not think about riding or, or anything for a few days brilliant yeah. stuff well well mateo uh hopefully i'll bump into you on the road at some point i'll be heading off to the tour so hopefully i'll see you there in the mix zone or wherever that might be um yeah look after yourself mate take care and uh and thanks very much again mate it's thanks, been a pleasure man. thank you so much matt it's really nice really nice conversation cheers